Joining me on the Red Tech Briefing today is Chris Boyce. He's from Canada. And th that's not your only claim to fame, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, no, the big news about Chris is he spent almost most of his life, all of his life almost, as a broadcaster working in radio. And then he decided to pack it in and move on and founded a company, co-founded a company called Pacific Content, which is essentially what I call a marketing company specializing in audio. But you've got a far better way to describe what you do. Please tell us, Chris. We like to describe it as we work with brands to create original content. And I think, you know, this was uh, at, at, there's been an interesting movement in the last uh, number of years where brands, I think, have realized they can be the content company. They don't need to just buy inventory on other people's programs. They can create their own content that connects with consumers. And that's what we do. We work with brands who want to be content creators, and we work specifically with them creating podcasts and other audio content. Okay, so when you transitioned out of radio into doing this, um, you'd already had a sense that this is where the market was going, this is where audio was going, or was this just a, hey, let me try something different? What, what, what drove you to this particular opportunity? <laughs> As someone who had worked at radio for many years, Omar, I was excited uh, since, you know, 20 years ago about the potential of digital audio, on-demand audio, streaming audio, podcasts to change the listening experience. And my frustration was it seemed to take forever for consumer adoption to tick up. And in some ways, there's so many things that is great about delivering audio that gets, you know, digitally that overcomes the challenges we have as traditional broadcasters, right? Where you have one frequency that you can deliver one signal 24 seven. Um, and it was frustrating actually, as we saw services like Netflix begin to take off and create this new video viewing experience and podcasting for the longest time and on-demand audio seemed to be moving really slowly, right? And in Canada, um, we would, you know, look at tracking studies that look at, you know, how many people had listened to a podcast in the last, in the last week. And if I go back to like, you know, 2010 to 2015, that number moved really slowly. So it might be like 12% of people one year, then 12.5%, then 13%. Um, suddenly, uh, a bit over five years ago, that number began to take off and, um, and I think it opened up a whole world of opportunity for anyone in the audio space because all of a sudden the rules changed and all of a sudden there was new opportunities to connect with audiences in new ways. What do you think the reason was for that switch? As you say, you, you almost described it as suddenly it took off and yet it had been germinating for such a long time. Why did it take that long and what was the trigger that suddenly got everybody, you know, more people, let's not say everybody, yeah, yeah. but far more people interested and looking for content on demand. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that, you know, the simple and maybe slightly glib answer is it's a far better, in many ways, it's a far better experience, right? You can listen to what you want, when you want, you know, how you want, right? It, it puts the consumer in, in charge. Um, but it was a great experience back in 2005, mm. uh, but the adoption really didn't take off till sort of, you know, 2015. I think there's a whole bunch of different answers. Um, you know, one uh, you know that a lot of people cite was the day that Apple put a podcast button on the home screen of uh, of the iPhone, and all of a sudden people are like, "What? What is this? Maybe mm -hmm. I'll I'll check it out." Um, I think that was also the time that we began to see, at least in North America, shows like Serial beginning to sort of you know enter the popular imagination and generate some buzz. Um, I also think historically. You know, if I look at that sort of like 2005 to 2015 period, podcasting felt really, really complicated. And in some mm. ways it was. It wasn't like Netflix where you just like, you know, clicked and started watching. The early days of podcasting, I had to, you know, open up iTunes. I had to download a podcast and I had to sideload it onto my iPod. Then I had to listen to it. I actually think what actually helped, you know, broad mainstream adoption of podcasting and streaming audio was eliminating a lot of that friction. It was mm. making it easy for consumers. Yeah. Uh, look, it's interesting. You're right. Access is, ease of access is really critical. That's why radio remains so important. Well, Absolutely. the car is so valuable for radio's future. We're going to get to that a bit later, but you said something interesting. You said it's a far better experience. And so because you've straddled both sides, you've been a pure linear broadcast guy, and now you're in the on-demand world, entirely in the on-demand world. When you think about the pros and cons for advertisers, 
and then yeah. the pros and cons for consumers. Just walk me through how you think about that now, having experienced both sides. N number one, I think we think far too much about the technical delivery mechanism of the audio and not enough mm -hmm. about the consumer experience, right? So as a broadcaster, we think a lot about, I have this 24 seven signal that's available on these devices that have AM, FM or DAB radio in people's houses. As a, as somebody who's living more in the sort of on-demand space, I think a lot about, you know, how am I delivering an RSS feed to podcast subscribers? The reality is consumers really don't care about any of that stuff. What they're really interested in is, can I listen to the piece of audio at the moment that I want to consume it that meets the need that I'm trying to fill, right? So I would suggest what all of us would be, you know, smart to do is take a step back from you know, viewing things through our lens, which is largely the sort of like the technical solution and really think about the consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, and the consumer really just wants great content available when they want it. And they don't really care, I don't think, about whether it comes over an AM radio or whether it's called a podcast or whether it's called an on-demand stream. So I would say, you know, always try to put yourself in the consumer's shoes mm -hmm. and think about what the, the consumer wants. I think you know, there are things that live radio still does incredibly, incredibly well, right? Like when there is breaking news, people want to listen to something that's live. They don't want to listen to a podcast that was consumed two days ago. The beauty of podcasting and on-demand audio is, um, you know, it is content that's available on demand w when you want it. You are also, you know, you're not having to fill a linear schedule anymore. And in some ways, maybe... Maybe that's the part that I've found most freeing is there isn't a 24 seven schedule that needs to be filled with content. You create the content um, and uh, and get it to consumers from from an advertiser point. of view. Wait, I wait, think... no, 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 no. I don't want you to hop there for it yet <laughs> because you said some very interesting things about linear and where it remains relevant. You talked about breaking news and that works right. both for linear TV yeah. and linear radio. It's in the moment. Yeah. But it sounds like there's very little space that remains sustainable then for linear media, television, radio. But let's just focus on radio because that example you use is a powerful one. But can you point to another one? Does it mean that when it comes to linear audio, apart from that example, there's no reason for anybody to listen to music radio linear because I'm in the mood for the Beach Boys today. Sorry, that's my age, even though that was before my time um, or the Beatles or whatever it is. Uh, it, I'm in the mood for a particular experience musically, and I'm not right. going to get that from six or seven FM choices or unlikely. So what are you saying about linear well, and what it means I, for their future? I, I, I do think with linear radio, there is there is a middle ground that includes music that is, you know, what most of us would look at as the you know morning drive or afternoon drive show where it's like, yes, the bulk of the content that I'm listening to is music, but I'm also interested in hearing about the weather, the traffic, the news, what's going on in my city, something that connects or grounds me to the day. And, you know, maybe I'm old fashioned, um, but I, I, I still tune to that mix of information because it, it, it's, it's a connection, not necessarily to one specific thing like breaking news, but it's a connection to my community and the, and the world around me. I think there are people increasingly who are trying to figure out how you turn that into a you know more digital customized experience so that you can hear the Beach Boys, but also hear about, you know, the barbecue, the community barbecue that's going on, the, you know, the news, the weather, the traffic. Um, none of the ones that I've tried so far that people have you know played around with are terribly rewarding. They sound like a bit of a disconnected experience with content dropped into, you know, um, uh, you know, a, a bit of a, <laughs> a segmented stream. Um, mm -hmm. But we're getting there. And I think that, you know, again, that's the sort of question I think broadcasters need to be thinking about is as we're moving in that direction, what are the things people value about me, my brand, my personalities, and how do I continue to deliver them? But I do think, and I know, you know, we may get to this later, I do think music radio is in a tougher position probably than talk radio as I project, you know, look out even further into, uh, into the future. Mm. And I want to make sure I'm not typecast as a Beach Boys guy. So I do listen to Lionel <laughs> Richie, Michael Jackson, uh, classical music, various things at various times of the day, depending on how I'm feeling. Let's talk about the advertising component now yeah. of this ecosystem. Yeah. What are the advantages for them 
from the on-demand world uh, and what are the cons and similarly for the linear world for advertisers well in the in the space specifically that we work in at Pacific Content, we are working with um, companies, with brands who don't want to be the interruption in someone else's content. They want to present the content themselves. And I think that's a, that is a huge advantage. And I think, you know, if you look back to the sort of the origin or the genesis of this, one of the companies that was, you know, first in this space was Red Bull. Um, and, you know, a lot of people look at Red Bull and the development of it as, yes, it's a energy drink, but it's also a media company and, you know, building up all of these content assets that are um, consistent with the, you know, the voice of the brand, the spirit of the brand. Um, but really what Red Bull has become is more of a lifestyle as opposed to just just an mm -hmm. energy drink. Um, I, I think a lot of companies look at Red Bull and they're like, what is our version of that, right? How do we be the Red Bull for entrepreneurs? How do we be the Red Bull mm. of banking? How do we be the Red Bull of, you know, fill in, fill in the blank? But I think, you know, what is driving it at is in some ways there are elements of the conventional advertising and marketing model that isn't as effective as it once was, right? And if you are hoping that your 30 second spot in the middle of a break full of, you know, five minutes of other 30 second spots is gonna connect and resonate with the consumer, um, that is getting increasingly, increasingly more difficult in a more cluttered and busier media landscape. So a lot of the brands that we work with don't want to be the interruption. They don't want to have mm. their message stuck in a you know, cluster of a bunch of other marketing messages and get lost. They want to um, forge a different relationship with their audiences. And, um, and instead of you know, creating content that is the interruption, they want to create content that is true, you know, truly valued by audiences that they get credit for producing and bringing to those audiences. And I think that's the, you know, you asked the question of, you know, what are the advantages and disadvantages mm -hmm. for a marketer of the on-demand space? I don't know that this is specific to the on-demand space, but this idea of brands transitioning into content companies and developing a different relationship with their audience, I think is relatively new. Um, and I think, you know, for the brands that we've worked with, it's been incredibly, incredibly powerful. Well, when you talked about that, you'd already, you already mentioned what you think are the cons of doing this in the linear space, the cluster of advertising, the being yeah. sandwiched as an interruption. Are there any pros to advertising on linear audio? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, you get incredible reach. Uh, you, you know, you are reach and you are reaching people in a moment so you can time a campaign. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, this isn't an ad that's been inserted that someone's going to listen to weeks or months down the, the line. Yeah. And I think, you know, in the, in the broadcast space, the smart, smart companies are thinking, again, not just about selling endless inventory of 15, 30 second and 60 second spots grouped into clusters. They're thinking about smart integrations. They're thinking about working with brands in a different way. Uh, and whether that's, you know, sponsored, you know, parts of shows or actual content integrations, I think they're beginning to think, uh, you know, beyond just, you know, selling, uh, selling a huge inventory of spots. Hmm. Good. That's that's helpful because if people haven't thought of it that work in radio, these are good tips and I appreciate it. Let me talk about radio broadcasters who are who have been for some time now considering the transition to the on-demand world. Now they're not thinking of giving up their FM licenses. Yeah. They want to run this as a, in parallel. Yeah. Uh, it requires a, a, quite some investment. So in the short term, what I've seen uh, for a lot of those that are making the move or have been making the move for a few years is they tend to do catch up rather yeah. than original content. Original content costs extra. Sure. You, need to, you need to write it. You need to bring people in. You need to you know, record it. It takes extra time. So catch up's the easy sort of answer. How do they compete effectively, though, with the focused on-demand players, many of whom seem to have investors with uh, limitless funding i mean it, some of them haven't made a profit in years but the you know there's funding available to keep scaling and then there's the radio guy working for shareholders who's shareholders saying hang on you know i can't have you in a situation where you just keep funneling or sucking up the money yeah. and there's nothing to show to the shareholder how do they compete 
Well, that- num- number one, Omar, I would say no one has limitless funding forever. And we That's have true. seen we have seen a lot of startups in the media and audio space burn through all of that funding. And at some point, the music stops playing and those who have a business case survive. So, um, you know, I think that's one thing to keep in mind is don't chase, you know, a short term race against people who are burning through cash who mm. may not be here in, in, in a year or two. Um, I think that question of, you know, how you create the content that is suitable for a digital or sort of on-demand universe really depends on what kind of game you're in. And I think, again, the question is, what about the con- the radio? Let's you know put ourselves in the shoes of someone who's a conventional radio broadcaster. What about the content that we're creating has value, truly has value for the audience? And how do we transfer that value from our live linear broadcast experience to an on-demand space. And I think the answer is what has value and what translates is really dependent on what kind of format you're in, right? Mm -hmm. So when I worked in public broadcasting in the sort of talk space, we produced a, you know, a lot of high quality, um, you know, half hour or hour long programs that might have only aired once at a very specific time. And if you were not available on Tuesday afternoons at 2.30, you were never going to hear that show. That translates exceptionally well into the on-demand space because somebody who wasn't available on Tuesday afternoon at 2.30 can now hear it just because they were at work or, you know, unavailable at the time now has an opportunity to listen to that program. That to me is like, that is a smart play. And Our strategy at the time was not to create volumes of high quality content because we had a library of content we believed that people would value that they just weren't hearing, right? Yeah. On the other hand, if you're a music station uh, and uh, you know you just stick your morning show online, three hours of like content available on demand, and people are tuning in, and the traffic's out of date, the weather's out of yeah, date, sure. the events are out of date. That's not a compelling experience. Likewise, I don't think any news you know station that you know runs a news wheel is going to be you know making that on demand mm-hmm. five days later. It might be valuable if you were able on your phone to you know listen to the, you know the newscast from five minutes ago. Um, sure. But if you're a music station, it might not be making your morning show available on on you know three hours of it available um, sure. on demand. It might be the highlight, the yeah. bit that the host worked on. It could be you know something that spins out into you know TikTok or onto social mm-hmm. media. But again, I think the question is sort of like, what about what we're creating has value to listeners, and how do mm-hmm. we transfer that value into another medium as opposed to saying? Well, the easy thing to do is just to like take this morning show and just like stick it on demand. Well, no one's going to listen to that because it's not a very good listening experience. And the thing that made it valuable in the first place, which is the currency, does not make the transition into the on-demand world. Mm. So if uh, this uh, radio owner is listening to us, right, we understand where the value is in catch up. You've described that exceptionally well. How do they make the investment to build up or do they need to make an investment to build up, build up? a library to compete more effectively of content that's less time bound. Is that an essential ingredient? Because the stuff that you're talking about, the broadcast is time bound. And of course, if a guy does a funny bit, yeah, it can last for weeks. If it's not around a particular moment, it's not, you know, made up around an incident that happened that day or yesterday in the city or town. So how do they build up? Do they need to build up? Um, a a library of original content to be an effective competitor in the on-demand space, or is that not necessarily, not not necessary? I I think it really depends on what kind of content you're creating and where you see an opportunity. I don't think that there is, you know, there are, you know, there are companies and there are broadcasters whose strength is a library of evergreen Mm. content. There are also people who are creating the kind of content where, you know, maybe that's not their brand or what people are ever going to go and, you know, look to them for. Mm. You know, the exercise that I would always urge people to do is we get locked very much into a mindset based on the business we've always been in and how we have always done things. The question I would ask is if I was starting this business today mm-hmm. and I had none of the sort of, you know, infrastructure I had built and the legacy, what would I create? You know, how would I use that broadcast frequency? But what else would I build around it if I was building it from scratch? Because I think the bias we bring in from 
our decades of experience and you know the way things were in a very different world 10 or 20 years ago begins to cloud our judgment and we're trying to think about how we take this thing and mm -hmm. turn it into another thing as opposed to um, what we would do if we were starting from scratch, which isn't to say you're going to be able to start from scratch. But if you actually sort of see, OK, this is what would make sense if I was beginning this today, I think it might allow you to make different decisions or to look at something a little bit uh, differently. So we alluded to this earlier when we talked about, you know, linear media, linear audio, radio, let's call yeah. it by what we generally yeah. call it, being fortunate to have convenience and access in motor vehicles. Absolutely. It's, it's helped in many cases sustain the medium because sometimes the listening is greatest, continues to be in certain places, greatest morning and after you said you, you retain yeah. that habit. I don't know if your kids retain or have that habit at all. <laughs> My kids don't, yeah. but um, certainly we, our generation does. So that, that is um, uh, definitely helpful in terms of uh, the sustainability of, of radio. But how long can that last? Because the car is not, I mean, already for, yeah. for five years, maybe longer, this, everything's about the connected car. Yeah. Um, and that means broadband availability, which means access to much more from an entertainment and information point of view. Yeah, the friction is going away. Right. Mm -hmm. And friction has been what has helped radio maintain that yeah. lead in the car. Right. Is um, it was interesting. Five years ago, uh, I looked at some research that had been done around car and why. And my question was, why is on demand or, you know, Internet delivered audio not bigger in the car? Right. Mm -hmm. It opens up a world of possibility. People are, you know, you know, in North America, often on long, you know, 25 minute, 45 minute commutes. Why wouldn't you want to broaden the, you know, the range of content that was available to you? And when you looked at the, the research that uh, a company that we were working with had done, it was all about friction. And mm -hmm. it was, oh, I have to have that cable that plugs my phone into the <laughs> jack and I don't really know how that works. And then I did it and then I was listening for five minutes and it stopped working. It was all about friction. Whereas you yes. know, people said, why do you choose radio? Well, I turned the ignition on and the sound came out. Um, <laughs> and it really got me thinking because, you know, five years ago I was... A passionate believer in you know redefining how audio was delivered I was a voracious listener who wanted to hear you know different stuff I had a car that you know that you know you could hook your phone up to and listen easily I had the cave I had all the stuff yeah and yet Omar I realized um, that probably 75% of the time I was listening to the radio right I was the perfect use case and I couldn't take the 30 seconds when I got into the car to hook the phone up and start and start listening. Um, and, and I, you know, and, and it wasn't even significant friction for me. It was just like literally plugging the cable into the phone. It wasn't the kind of friction that somebody who had none of the, you know, it, 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 you know, it, who was starting from scratch on this. So I always say to people, don't underestimate friction and don't, you know, don't um, ever, you know, stop believing in you know the value of ease of use yes but all that said that is changing because most modern cars now uh have some sort of entertainment system built in many of them had interfaces that sucked the interfaces are getting better it's getting mm -hmm. easier um so again i think what radio needs to do is think about what is the compelling proposition and how do they get listeners to consume their compelling proposition instead of all of the other stuff that is, is, is out there. The advertisers, I want to hop back to something you were talking about earlier. Yeah. You know, you talked about those advertisers who say they don't want to be part of an experience that's interrupting listeners. And yeah. that's why they don't want to be in 30 second spots. And that's why they're coming to you. Are those leaving radio? Are those advertisers, the ones that, I mean, frankly, your experience, have they stopped using yeah, the radio yeah. for what they want? They're using Pacific content and other companies that create content, audio content that, uh, you know, they prefer that is n a non-interruptive um, experience. Is that what they're doing? No. no. And, you know, what? The, the reality is there is no, I'm, you know, I, I'm trying to, I'm going through the, our client list in my head. I can't think of a single company we've worked with that has abandoned their conventional okay. mix of advertising completely. Uh, you know, there's no one who is going to say, oh, I can get 
uh, the same results out of this mm -hmm. podcast that I am creating um, as I got out of that whole traditional mix of you know media I might have bought in the past, which could have included radio, TV, outdoor, digital. Um, but I think what you're beginning to see is it is complementary and that it might shift. And maybe they buy less radio, more digital, mm -hmm. and their own creation created content. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't at this point see clients walking away. And you know, the reality is, even if a brand creates their own podcast and their own content, they tend to rely on other conventional channels to tell people about it and get them to listen to it, right? So even in the space that we live in, which is creating original podcasts with brands, there is still work that has to be done using conventional marketing channels to get yeah. people to listen to that content. The end result though, is they are, you know, what, what is amazing for you know, brands that create their own original content is the engagement that they have with an audience, right? You have somebody you know, we look at completion rates that are often in the sort of like 85 to 95 percent range. So if you're looking at a half hour podcast, you are mm -hmm. getting 25 to 30 minutes of someone's attention. Right. Yeah. You contrast that to what completion rates look like on content on YouTube or how much of a blog post gets read. And to me, that is the magic of podcasting for brands or for media companies is yeah. you have a huge amount of someone's attention and you are forging a deep intimate bond with that person. That's true whether the content was created by a brand or created by a media company. That to me is the beauty of the space is it's the intimacy of radio, but it's the, you know, it is some magic engagement that, you know, we rarely see uh, in other in other media. To round up Chris, fascinating conversation and thank you for the wisdom. You've spoken about these things, but I wanted you to essentially package it into a neat summary. It's what you do at Pacific <laughs> Content. You package things and uh, take volumes of information and make them edible in bite-sized chunks. So I'm going to ask you to do the same. I'll play out a scenario. If radio owners keep doing this, the medium will suffer. Well, I, I think the medium will suffer if they continue to think about their brand and their content strictly as something that is delivered over an over-the-air radio signal. If they think about the technical delivery mechanism that they have historically used as their you know, primary defining characteristic of who they are and what they do, I think they're in trouble. If they begin to think of it as the audience does, which is a range of content delivered over a bunch of different platforms, I think they're much more better positioned to succeed in the future. But I think so often, the, the, we have a legacy bias and we have a legacy bias, which is technically oriented. And that's not how consumers consume content. Yeah, I think you've probably answered this one, but just in case you've got another thought, radio owners must start doing this to ensure the longevity of their enterprise. I'll throw you a new thought here because Go I, ahead. I think this Go one ahead. is actually really important is they need to start thinking about not just their local market, but thinking potentially about a global market. And I think all of us think primarily about local markets because radio signals <laughs> by virtue of the, how the radio spectrum worked and was divided and divvied up around the world are inherently local. And I'm not saying you should abandon your local, uh, your local market, but the beauty of a podcast or on-demand audio is it's available in your local market, it's available in the next city over, it's available in the next country over, it's available across the world. And I think so often traditional broadcasters go in with a very closed mindset, right? We create content for Toronto audiences. We create content for Canadian audiences and the podcasting or on-demand audio space is international, right? It is as easy to reach uh, a listener in New York as it is in Toronto, as it is in Lisbon, as it is in South Africa or Australia. And I think which is not to say you need to lose your focus and go after everyone, but it opens up new opportunities that were never available when we had a terrestrial radio signal, which might have had, you know, the ability to, you know, you know, reach people over 100 kilometers. All of a sudden, the world is a possibility. And I, I think so often, you know, broadcasters at their own peril get, again, locked into the construct that they've lived in historically, and they miss out on a potential opportunity that could exist beyond that, that area that they've traditionally operated.
Interesting thought, Chris. You've opened up a whole can of worms here because I, you're now forcing me to say to you, but the moment you start looking at the world yeah. as the opportunity, you also multiply your competition. Absolutely. And, and, and again, I think this comes back to that question of sort of like, what is it that listeners value about us and where can we compete? And again, it may be very different depending what format you're in, what genre you're in, or even the personalities that you have, right? But there would have been a day where, you know, um, you know, a personality could only address a very specific local market. And we, are, I think, are in, you know, an era of global personalities and global content brands. So the opportunity is to figure out, is that a fit for you? What I would urge people is not to discard it just because you've never thought that way before. Chris Boyce is co-founder of Pacific Content. Thank you for your time and your wisdom here on the Red Tech Briefing, Chris. Thanks, Omar. It's been fun. <laughs>